Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions, and the portfolio on this occasion is social justice. I'd remind members that questions three, four, and seven are grouped together, so I'll take any supplementaries on those after all three questions have been answered. Uh, and as usual, if any member wants a supplementary question, they should press the request to speak button during the relevant question. Uh, the usual appeal for brevity in questions and responses applies, and I call question number one, Alistair Allen, who joins us remotely. To ask the Scottish Government how its housing strategy is supporting people on low incomes to move towards greener energy use in their homes. Minister Patrick Harvey. We support people on low incomes to move toward and benefit from greener energy through our local area-based schemes and the National Warmer Homes Scotland Service. The new Warmer Homes Scotland Service relaunched earlier this week and aims to reach many more vulnerable households. We support social landlords and their tenants to benefit from energy efficiency and heating improvements through our social housing net zero heat fund. And we support every household uh, in Scotland uh, with free and impartial advice about greener energy use and lower energy bills from our Home Energy Scotland service. Alistair Allen. I thank the Minister for that uh, response. The vast majority of homes in my constituency, as he knows, rely on heating oil LPG or electric storage heaters as they cannot connect to the gas grid. My, constitu my constituency also has some of the highest levels of fuel poverty in the country. Is there any additional support available to households in rural and island areas uh, in improve to help them improve the energy efficiency of their homes and move to greener heating solutions? Minister. Uh, yes, indeed. We recognise that households in remote rural and island communities face higher costs as well as experiencing some of the highest rates of fuel poverty in Scotland, and this is reflected in the targeting and level of support available. Uh, since last December, we've provided an extra £1,500 on top of our £7,500 uh, Home Energy Scotland uh, heating and energy efficiency grants uh, due to the higher costs in rural areas. Fuel poor households in off-gas areas also benefit from higher levels of funding as part of the area-based schemes and Warmer Homes Scotland service. And under our Social Housing Net Zero Heat Fund, uh, making £200 million available up to 2026 to support social landlords in this agenda, uh, the, again, rural areas will benefit of, of with an 11 per cent uplift, while those in remote areas can get 22 per cent more funding. I have visited a number of social housing providers, uh, including in uh, Argyll Community Housing Association most recently, who have already installed uh, more than, uh, uh, than 1,400 – almost 1,400 air source heat pumps, more than a quarter of their housing stock, and a great many of these organisations are leading the way. Thank you, Minister. A brief supplementary. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. A recent parliamentary question answered by the Minister showed a massive disparity between Edinburgh and Glasgow in the number of homes which have been retrofitted through the Social Housing Net Zero Heat Fund. In the last two financial years, Edinburgh has been awarded a total of 116 grants compared to Glasgow's 7,260. Glasgow accounting for 65 of all grants delivered in Scotland. Now, I appreciate that Glasgow has a higher number of social housing landlords than other parts of Scotland. However, that doesn't seem to account for the disparity. So can the Minister explain why Glasgow has received a disproportionately high number of grants and what's happening for other parts of the country? Minister. Well, the Social Housing Net Zero Heat Fund is, of course, available throughout the country and it requires uh, organisations to bid. We work very well with uh, social housing providers right throughout the country uh, I, I, I'm happy to explore the, the figures if Mr Briggs wants to write to me uh, about that in particular. But uh, I think the, the most important thing is that social housing providers in all parts of the country, urban, rural, east, west, north, south, are already benefiting from this investment, will continue to do so, and we're keen to continue to work with them. A good question to Sharon Derry. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on how and when it will introduce a leavers fund for victims of domestic abuse, which would provide a social security payment for those who feel the need to flee their homes. Cabinet Secretary Shirley Amson. We strongly believe that financial uncertainty should not be a barrier to women leaving an abusive relationship, which is why we are firmly committed to looking at what we can do to provide financial support when needed. We are continuing to work closely with organisations such as Scottish Women's Aid and COSLA to explore how a fund providing immediate financial assistance could work in practice and be best targeted. We hope to be able to provide further detail on this work very shortly. Sharon Dowie. 
thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Uh, domestic abuse crimes have risen to record levels in recent years. A leavers fund to help survivors of abuse leave their homes safely would be a big step forward, and charities say it would leave, save lives. It was agreed by the Scottish Government in 2020, but we still don't have a timeline for its implementation. So could the Cabinet Secretary tell me, is it still going to go ahead? And if so, when does she expect the fund to be operational? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, uh, President Officer. As I said in my original answer, we expect to make the announcement on this uh, very shortly. This is something which the Government is and will remain committed to, recognising that we need to support women to ensure that they have any support that they require to leave an unsafe or an abusive relationship. And I repeat again, we will make that announcement very shortly. Question three, Ben McPherson. To ask the Scottish Government whether it is considering specific solutions to support the City of Edinburgh Council and other relevant organisations to address Edinburgh's social housing shortage and growing population pressures, including providing additional resources in its 24-25 budget. Minister Paul McLennan. I have met with Edinburgh's housing community on a number of occasions and invited bespoke proposals to address the specific challenges facing the capital city, which has formed the basis of an in-depth discussion around about potential areas of Scottish Government support for Edinburgh. My officials regularly engage with Edinburgh Council on additional expenditure capacity that they may have, which is dependent on overall availability of resources and delivery of their existing programme. We are making available £234 million in Edinburgh over this Parliament to support affordable housing delivery. Decisions around about capital spending for 2024-25 will be presented to Parliament in due course. Ben McPherson. I thank the Minister for that answer and I appreciate the severe pressures on the public finances and the significant investment in housing nationally that the Scottish Government has made since 2007 and is, is making in the period ahead. And I also uh, appreciate the Minister's uh, commitment and uh, communication there about discussing bespoke solutions with uh, City of Edinburgh Council. As part of that, can the Scottish Government commit to either altering the way it, the affordable housing supply programme is allocated through the strategic housing investment plan to build more social houses in Edinburgh quicker, considering the population pressure and the specific issues? Uh, and also, can the Minister consider how additional resource can be provided to City of Edinburgh Council uh, in terms of addressing the serious Minister. issues Minister. of homelessness? Minister. I thank the member for his uh, follow-up. The Strategic Housing Investment Framework, which is a mechanism for allocating funding to local authorities, was agreed with COSLA in 2012 and covers 30 of the 32 local authorities in Scotland, with Edinburgh and Glasgow sitting out with us. If Edinburgh wished to open up that discussion, you should take that forward through COSLA. Funding for Edinburgh over this Parliament is 21 per cent higher than the previous Parliament. And last year, we were able to direct an additional £10 million for investment in Edinburgh. Off officials continue to engage regularly with Council partners to discuss programme capacity, not only just now, but obviously for future years of development. Question four, Sarah Boy. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the City of Edinburgh Council regarding funding to address the housing shortage resulting from population growth. Minister Paul McLennan. Probably answered probably previous, uh, in the previous question there, but affordable housing supply programme investment, as I said, was at a record level of £234 million. And officials are in regular discussion with Edinburgh Council around about the additional capacity, as I said, not just at this moment, but in the, in the strategic areas of investment going that forward as well. And just as I'm referring to the previous question, Emory Council benefited from a further £10 million at that particular time. Um, resource planning assumptions are in place for each year up to 25-26. Sarah Boy. Can I thank the Minister for his answer and declare a register of interest in my former work with SFHA. I'm sure the Minister will be aware that in the last three years, the actual numbers of housing built for social rent is way below the level needed and that the city has been underfunded for years. So would the Minister commit today to address the fundamental issue of increasing the share of funding for Edinburgh and say whether he agrees with the City of Edinburgh Council estimate that a thousand new social rent homes are needed every year over the next decade um, and will he accept that Scottish Government funding is critical to delivering the level of growth given the population increases we've got and the fact that the house building sector needs confidence and certainty to deliver the supply change, the staff and the land that we need to build that housing? Minister. 
thank the member for that question. I, I think coming back to the point I made to, to Mr McPherson, we are in discussions now around about what the capacity is within the Council to look at uh, within this, 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 this uh, year's and another future is obviously in this ter uh, parliamentary term. In terms of looking at other strategic development sites, we are in discussion with the Edinburgh Council around about what we can do to work with them in, in that regard. And obviously, as I said, we are, we are in regular discussions and talking about bespoke solutions, not just around about uh, resource funding, but also the capital funding as well. Question seven, Miles uh, To ask the Scottish Government what additional resources are being allocated to help support Edinburgh City Council to address housing shortages, including the number of families in temporary accommodation, in light of the figures showing that over a quarter of all children in temporary accommodation are in Edinburgh. Minister Paul McLennan. Uh, this year, the City of Edinburgh Council said, is receiving a record £234 million pounds to address its housing priorities, and probably you're fair to the answers I've made to, to Ms Boyack and, and, and Mr McPherson. In terms of that, number of households in, with children in temporary accommodation in Edinburgh is concerning. Um, I'm not going to dispute that. Houses with children spend longer uh, on average in temporary accommodation due to the demand for larger uh, homes. We are in bespoke discussions uh, around about that in terms of what we need to do specifically for, for Edinburgh. We are working to acquire more housing for use as temp permanent homes and maximise the use of existing homes. We will invest at least £60 million pounds this year through the Affordable Housing Supply Group, uh, Programme to support a national acquisition plan. This obviously will help to boost affordable housing supply in Edinburgh, obviously uh, open to, to invite uh, uh, applications for that. Well, um, I thank the Minister for that answer. I'm not sure if the Minister or the Cabinet Secretary really are aware of the emergency situation we're seeing in Edinburgh. Latest figures show that 2,265 children are living in temporary accommodation, up 20% on last year and an increase of 930% since 2002. We need to see more action than what we've heard to the three answers today. As Ben McPherson has said, the capital faces unique challenges with higher land costs and greater demand for housing. So can I ask the Minister if the Scottish Government will look specifically at a temporary accommodation fund for Edinburgh to actually look at some new solutions and models to try to address this? A number of points probably just to raise on that. One, obviously, I talked about and bespoke conversations are going on. That's already around about capital and also on, on resource. In terms of the points about being making fully aware of the situation, I've met with the convener probably three or four times since being in post, and I have another meeting coming up very shortly. Also met Shelter very recently on that matter, and also met Crisis in that regard as well. So there obviously there's a temporary task and finish uh, recommendations that came forward. We talked about the £60 million for acquisitions and also talking about allocations and so on. So these are part of the, the discussions that we have with Edinburgh uh, at the moment. So the discussions are ongoing, they'll continue ongoing. Officials meet every week with Edinburgh Council and they said I meet regularly with Edinburgh and we'll meet with them again very shortly. Thank you. Um, noting that these are questions about Edinburgh Council's budget and housing, I call a supplementary from Audrey Nicholl. Thank you. The £60 million National Acquisition Plan announced this summer looks set to accelerate the Scottish Government's work to get people and families out of a temporary accommodation and into a space that they can call their own. Can the Minister provide an update on the rollout of this fund and the work being done with experts and local government to ensure that it is effective? Yeah, can I Minister. thank the, the, the member for that question? Yeah, I mean, at the moment, obviously, the £60 million is available for local authorities to apply to. There are a number of authorities that have indicate, uh, indicated an interest uh, in that, so there are discussions ongoing in that regard. Obviously, we work very closely with COSLA uh, as well as key partners, and I mentioned a previous meeting with Shelter uh, and also Crisis. So the, you know, there has been uh, significant discussions around, around about that. Question five, Michelle Thompson. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions the Social Justice Secretary has had with ministerial colleagues regarding the support available to families experiencing poverty, including as a result of high energy costs. Cabinet Secretary. Tackling poverty is at the heart of what we do as a government, and I recently convened the first meeting of the new Tackling Child Poverty Ministerial Oversight Group, which will meet regularly to help drive action where required. We know households are struggling after years of austerity, a hard Brexit and the economic mismanagement at the hands of the Conservative Government at Westminster. That is why we have allocated almost £3 billion to tackle poverty and protect people from harm during the ongoing cost of living crisis, with the Fuel and Security Fund tripled to £30 million this year. Michelle Thompson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for those remarks and, and I welcome the significant interventions of the Scottish Government using the limited devolved powers at its disposal, especially on this Challenge Poverty Week. But does the Cabinet Secretary agree that poverty reduction in Scotland is undermined by a frankly illogical approach to social security in Westminster and that perhaps an essentials guarantee from the UK Government would go a long way to alleviating their disproportionate pressure 
being placed on devolved budgets. Cabinet Secretary. Well, Michelle Thompson raises a, a very important point, and I absolutely agree with her on it. Uh, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation estimates that if universal credit standard allowance were set at £120 per week for a single adult and £200 for a couple this year, that could lift 1.8 million people out of poverty, including 600,000 children across the UK. Levels of universal credit have been too low for too long, and the Scottish Government has called on the UK Government to introduce an essentials guarantee, and I have written to my UK uh, counterpart um, on this issue as well. It is very, very important that we all do everything that we can to ensure that Social Security benefits adequately cover the cost of essentials and better protect our most vulnerable people. And supplementary, Beatrice Wishart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In Shetland's local annual, local annual Child Poverty Action Report, it was estimated that a household in Shetland would need to earn £104,000 a year to avoid being in fuel poverty. Shetland's cooler and windier climate, poor insulation levels and lack of availability of the cheapest energy options further compound the effect on families of high energy costs. What is the Scottish Government's support strategy to help prevent children and families experiencing poverty from living in cold and unheated homes this winter? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I uh, direct Beatrice Wishart to the uh, answer that was given by my colleague Patrick Harvey earlier on which, uh, to Alistair Allen, uh, which dealt with many of these issues. But uh, for a summary of that, President Officer, I would say that we have allocated £350 million to heat energy efficiency and fuel poverty measures this year, including £119 million targeted at fuel poor households. Funding for our updated Warmer Homes Scotland service, which restarted on Monday, stands at £55 million, its highest ever level. And the budget for our local authority area-based schemes also continues at a record level of £64 million this year. Thank you. Question six, Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will commission independent analysis of the impact that its interventions, including the Scottish Child Payment, Carers Allowance Supplement and the Baby Box, have had on social justice. Cabinet Secretary. We have published evaluations for the Scottish Child Payment, Carers Allowance Supplement and the Baby Box. These evaluations, which included research by independent contractors, showed a positive impact on social justice in Scotland, with the Scottish Child Payment contributing to the overall aim of reducing child poverty. The Young Carers Grant positively impacting on carers' finances and their feelings of well-being, and the Baby Box having a positive impact on families, particularly for a first-time younger and lower-income parents. Christine Graham. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her reply. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation's annual Poverty in Scotland report was published this week, highlighting the significant impact that the increased Scottish child payment is likely to have had on child poverty levels. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, and can I ask if how I access this data, which would be very useful, supporting all the interventions, not just the Scottish child payment, are having on poverty in ch children? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. Well, we know our actions are making a difference, with 90,000 fewer children expected to live in relative and absolute poverty this year as a result of Scottish Government policies. And that includes lifting an estimated 50,000 children out of relative poverty through the investment in our Scottish child payment, described by Professor Dar Danny Dorling as the biggest fall in child poverty anywhere in Europe for at least 40 years. And I would be happy to provide Christine Graham and indeed other members in the Chamber of further details about the work that we are doing to ensure that we are on the right track to meet our statutory targets, eradicate child poverty in Scotland and the difference the Scottish Government policies are making. And what a shame that UK welfare policies at the same time are pushing children into poverty. And question eight, Tess White. To ask, <clears throat> to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on cladding re remediation in Scotland. Mr Paul McLennan. The safety of homeowners and residents is our absolute priority. That is why the programme for government sets out proposals for a cladding remediation bill that will give ministers new powers to ensure the remediation of buildings with unsafe cladding and why are we seeking the transfer of powers in order to create a building safety levy. We are undertaking a robust programme of single building assessments. Those assessments are being completed and remediation work is already underway. We are committed to undertaking a stock survey and ensuring buildings in the pilot programme are on a single building assessment pathway. Tess White. Minister, the re reality is that progress towards removing dangerous cladding has been pitiful. 
The Scottish Government has the financial resources it needs, but it has spent barely 4% of the UK Government's allocation for cladding remediation. And now we're hearing that more powers are needed to make progress. Can the Minister provide a timeline for the proposed cladding remediation bill and explain what action will be taken to expedite this process in the meantime? Minister. I obviously disagree with our assessment of the progress it's made uh, so far. Uh, I've had a number. I think one of the key things in terms of this is making sure we're working with developers uh, on this as we develop the programme. And I've met with them on a number of occasions, both in the round table and individually, um, in terms of that. So I think one of the key things in, in that regard is to work with them uh, extensively, and we are working very closely in, in that regard. In terms of the, the bill, you know, we're going through the process just now, and obviously I met with our colleague Miles Briggs, as he knows, a few weeks ago, and talked to him about the principles of the bill, but I agreed to meet with him, and I'm happy to meet with yourself again, Ms White, in terms of that, when the full details of the bill come through, and to discuss that further. And supplementary, Bill Kidd. Thank you very much, President Officer. Um, the, clad the, cladding, the cladding remediation bill was a welcome addition to the programme for government. Uh, can the Minister elaborate on how the new powers in this bill will build on the groundwork already carried out by the Scottish Government and local partners to identify high-rise buildings in need of remedial work, please? Minister. Yes, thanks. thanks, the member, for his, his supplementary. Again, coming back to the discussion, we obviously had a number of the questions and meetings with developers in terms of that. Now, we will introduce a bill, as I said, to support the delivery of the cladding programme and prioritise the safety of homeowners and residents. So my discussions with homeowners and developers and evidence from our own pilot work has highlighted key issues. Now, these include challenges in securing consent, assessment and remediation work, especially from non-resident homeowners, delivering on the commitment to create a register of buildings which have undergone assessment and required necessary remediation to be carried out. We are committed to ensuring that developers make a fair contribution to the programme and to identifying buildings and scope. Thank you, Minister. That concludes portfolio questions on social justice. There will be a brief pause uh, while front benches change before we move on to the next item of business. <laughs>